Today's reading is from Revelation 21, 10 through 12, and 22, 1 and 2. Um, you can find that on um, pages 244 and 245 in, the, in your pew Bible. And in the spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me Ugh, I can't see it. <laughs> showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It has the glory of God and a radiance like a very rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It has a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates are inscribed the names of the 12 tribes of the Israelites. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for, healing, are for the healing of the nations. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And would you pray with me? O oh Lord, may the words of our mouth, of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. This sermon series began in the opening chapters of the Bible, at least as it comes to us. It began in a primordial garden, a garden that was peaceful and filled with innocence. And in that sermon, we affirmed our basic Christian belief that God is the creator of all things. And in that sermon, we acknowledged that something went wrong with that wonderful divine creation. And what went wrong went wrong not by God's design, but by human freedom. Then last Sunday, we spoke of God's second mighty work, the mighty work of redeeming the world, of coming among us in the, pers in the person of Jesus Christ, and that by his life, death, and resurrection, what went wrong has the potential to be made right. So today I ask us to consider the mighty work of the Holy Spirit. And the mighty work of the Holy Spirit is to keep the risen Christ present within the church and to bind us together as a community seeking God's future. Whenever I think of this idea, I think of the great hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory, written by Harry Emerson Fosdick down in New York City in the height of the Great Depression. He wrote these words, crown thine ancient church's story, bring her bud to glorious flower. Flowering would be very similar to the word fruition. I also think of the great hymn by Charles Wesley, Love divine, all loves excelling. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless, let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. The mighty work of God is to bring God's creation to its fulfillment and to its fullness. 
Now, I don't believe that the book of Revelation is a book that we are to take literally. The scary images that we find in those pages were never intended by its author to create fear. They were designed to create comfort. The overarching message of that book is that no matter what goes wrong in the realm of human experience, there is a divine purpose and providence being played out. And its message is to stay faithful, to remain confident. And I'm kind of sad I'm kind of sad that some of the church's more uh, unsavory characters, shall I say, (laughs) have misused the book of Revelation. I remember one preacher using the images of Revelation in such a way. After I listened to the sermon, we we had a conversation. And he said he, he wanted to make people afraid of the judgment of God so that they would be ready to receive the mercy of God. He wanted to use fear to motivate conversion. I told them that I thought that was professional malpractice. (laughs) I thought it was a very bad interpretation of the text if you read them. I thought it was being abusive to people. And further, I went on to say that any conversion that is rooted in fear cannot be sincere and cannot be a foundation for a vital and lively faith. The big picture of the book of Revelation is that no matter what may happen in the realm of human life, God is actively engaged in the world and is leading the human community toward fulfillment. In the letter, the book of Revelation ends where Farron read for us this morning. The vision of John, seeing the holy city coming out of heaven and descending to the earth. A city that is beautiful and at peace. A city where there is no more warfare and no more human destruction. You might note if you go back and read that, that there's no temple in the holy city because it's not needed. Religious buildings are constructed to remind us of God. But in that holy city, God is always present. You see, here in this life, We tend to encounter God, the mystery of God, in in kind of ways that are hard to get our hands on. Maybe it's a a glimpse here and, and a glimpse there, and we walk toward it with faith, doing our best to understand. But a time will come when God is so fully present, there is no uncertainty just the light and the presence of our God. The world made new has whispers of the ancient prophets as they envisioned a day when all the mighty empires that had been at war would come to holiness and that the nations of the world would gain a deep respect, a deep respect that creates a peaceful coexistence 
everywhere. That's the vision of the world brought to its fruition, brought to completion. Well, I think I got a little glimpse of that new city on Thursday afternoon. I never heard the word fruition used as many times in one hour as I did when we gathered to kick off and celebrate the beginning of a new ministry here in the city of Concord, the ministry called Family Promise. Don Johnson's here with us today, and uh, he's the interim director, and in a few moments, I'll call him forward. But the big picture of this program is that it is meant to help many congregations to organize themselves to care for those families that are experiencing homelessness. It's not simply a shelter where they come in and are out of the rain for a night, but it is a holistic program where we use our skills to intervene in the lives of those who are struggling, helping them to care for themselves while they gain the strength to do it on their own. No doubt you know a little bit of the story. About five years ago, Jonathan Hopkins came to the uh, Concordia Lutheran Church in the city of Concord. And his congregation had been a part of that. And he got really excited about this program. And then Robin Nashti came to Temple Beth, uh, Beth Israel, Jacob, and uh, she too had been involved with it. And their excitement just started percolating all across the city. Their excitement spread to our church. Dan Haynes and Gail Page were very involved in the board that pulled this ministry together. And Pastor Roseanne Roberts was a spark plug for that endeavor as well. So I'd like to invite you all to come forward now. We're, uh, we're beginning this new ministry. Now I told you about the excitement, but there was another person who got very excited about this program. And perhaps you remember, her name is Roddy Ashley. We were just getting it off the ground about five years ago. And uh, we were publicizing it in our church uh, communications. And Roddy heard about it. And Roddy heard about it in the closing days of her life. She had been diagnosed with uh, cancer and she knew that her time was short. And as we were talking, she said that she wanted to make a difference with her life and that as she uh, left this world, she wanted to leave something behind, a, a bit of a, a, a legacy of her deep spirit that was always loving, always concerned, and always compassionate. So she left uh, some money, and uh, as we were talking, the ministry was just getting formed, and well, you know how things, when they first start, you're not quite sure they'll make it to fruition. So she asked us to kind of hold on to the money until we were convinced that uh, it would be up and running and worthy of her life gift. Well, Don, you came on pretty quickly and uh, you brought some wonderful leadership to this program. Folks have been working hard to pull it together, but uh, you brought uh, uh, an executive skill set to it to help bring it all together. So uh, I, uh, I want to thank you for that. And uh, I'd like to make a presentation to you now.
This is uh, the life gift of one of our members, Roddy Ashley. It's for the sum of $21,045. So uh, we give it with excitement, with enthusiasm, with love, and with great hope. Delighted that this program is beginning. So on her behalf, we give this to you. Thank you very much, Pastor Hay, and thank you very much, Wesley Church, and we certainly are grateful for the life of Roddy Ashley and for her committing this life commitment to the wonderful ministry that we know as Family Promise of Greater Concord.